Welcome everyone. We are starting our first out of uh, three panels. Uh, there's going to be a, well, we're today on Tuesday, so there's going to be one more panel tomorrow on regulation and one panel on Thursday that's going to be on startups. And um, so the panel today is on the topic of future of cryptocurrencies. And uh, we're always reminded in such set settings that uh, making predictions is very hard especially concerning the future. Uh, with that note, we'll, we'll go ba basically maybe um, just in a linear order and each one present three minutes yourself and um, what's your view on the future of uh, cryptocurrencies? Uh, okay, hi, can you hear me? I'm Zuko and I'm the Zcash guy. And whew, my predictions on the future of cryptocurrencies. Well, I hadn't thought about this question before now, so I'm going to say some things off the top of my head. Um, in the recent past, I've noticed a whole lot of money pouring into cryptocurrencies of various kinds. And at this conference, I've noticed a whole lot of innovation happening of the kind that I like, which is kind of highly technical decentralized innovation. So therefore, I predict that there's going to be, um, in about two years, um, another wave of really interesting decentralized improvements and upgrades. And I think they will mostly arrive in new blockchains and, and or new tokens. Um, instead of being extensions or improvements to Bitcoin or Zcash or um, built on top of Ethereum. The, the, inter the improvements I'm thinking of are, are things that are currently, apparently, um, being funded and worked on on new blockchains. So that's my current thought. Hi, uh, my name is Neha, and I lead the Digital Currency Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, I think that the future could go in one of two ways, and I'm currently split on which way. So either I think something Bitcoin or Ethereum-like will um, develop. I don't know if it will be Bitcoin or Ethereum or something sort of that ends up coming up like a new chain. Oh, it, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it will have features like uh, Lightning, and um, it will enable micropayments. It will evolve. It will be sort of this ubiquitous programmable money. Uh, the other way, and I think it will be pretty decentralized, um, the other way I, I could see things evolving. One of my colleagues likes to say that we wouldn't have Netflix without BitTorrent. So I could see fiat currencies um, kind of adopting some of what we've learned from the cryptocurrency world and in issuing digital currency, digital fiat currency, and incorporating some of the, perhaps the scripting and some of the layer two solutions, maybe even some of the anonymity solutions. And um, so we'd have uh, essentially central bank issued digital currency that looked a little bit more like cryptocurrency. Hi, I'm Manny from the Israeli Bitcoin Association. My background is in mathematics, mostly machine learning. I've been in Bitcoin since 2011, did all kinds of stuff. Right now I'm focusing on work to promote the usage of Bitcoin and the blockchain technology here in Israel. And I'd like to share a story. Several years ago, uh, there was a new story that said that Peter Thiel made the remark that he estimates that there is about a 20% chance that Bitcoin will succeed. And my first uh, reflex was to be angry. I thought, how dare he say that it's only 20%, it should be 90% or whatever. And then I thought about it and I realized that actually giving a 20% estimate for the success of Bitcoin is very optimistic. If we consider how profound and, uh, and huge the impact that Bitcoin can have if it succeeds according to the more optimistic projections, then we can understand that 20% chance of that is a really huge thing, and it's definitely something uh, worth fighting for. So definitely Bitcoin and more generally the blockchain technology can transform the economy, transform a lot of aspects of our lives, and uh, neither of us are prophets. prophets. We don't know if it will happen or not, but I sure do hope that it will. 
So there are some very accurate predictions I can make about the future. So for example, I can predict that the Earth will undergo almost exactly 36,624 rotations in the next 100 years. But um, about blockchain technology, uh, unfortunately, social science is much, much more hazy. Um, so the, I think right now, we are, my opinion is that we're in a phase where the main limiting factor for our blockchain technology adoption actually is the technology. So we're at the point where there is a large amount of institutional hype. So, you know, when Vladimir Putin knows what blockchains are and when Paris Hilton is, is actively promoting her ICO, you know that we, <laughs> you know that we, you know, we have a large amount of hype. But, and having personally talked to people, even, you know, just ranging from some just small developers to people working inside the UN, I know that there is interest in adopting blockchain technologies in just all sorts of different, different places. But people are waiting for, you know, practical solutions that can solve scalability, solve privacy issues, and particular, uh, and solve security issues. And probably all three of those are important if we want to see a really large scale adoption. And I do think that you know, like, at least one of the three whole, uh, one of those uh, three issues with uh, scalability possibly even being the near term most uh, severe one um, are the things that are basically holding a lot of people back from you know, flipping the switch and just using this for something that'll, uh, that'll touch 20 million people. That's just kind of my own estimate from uh, kind of just talking to people and hearing what people are up to and kind of the general if just feel from different sides about about the technology. So I'm Peter Van Valkenburg. I'm the director of research at Coin Center, which is a nonprofit research and advocacy center focused in or based in Washington D.C. That's focused on the public policy, regulatory, legal implications of the emergence of open blockchain networks and decentralized computing technologies. So, to the extent I have more of a legal or regulatory focus, my predictions uh, for the future. I guess uh, I want to say two things. Um, one, I agree with Vitalik, absolutely. Social science is hazy and future predictions are, um, you know, uh, foolhardy. However, we can sometimes look to history and try and find metaphors. Uh, Mark Andreessen has said that uh, Bitcoin or open blockchain networks are something like the internet in 1995. Uh, he actually said that about four or five ye or years ago now. Um, so I think he was a little uh, premature, probably, and uh, I'm maybe more of the opinion that what we're seeing now is the creation of protocols more akin to the base layer protocols of the internet, things like TCP IP. So maybe we're back in like the, you know, 80s, early 90s now. From a policy response, then, what do we see? Not very much. There was very little internet law in the early to mid 1990s. It was this emerging technology that policymakers were vaguely aware of. They had all kinds of names for it, just like we have all kinds of names for this technology. I said open blockchain networks, which is something I like to say because it kind of excises out some of the enterprise solutions that we've seen take the mantle of blockchain. But we also hear uh, DLT, we hear cryptocurrency, of course. Um, the internet was referred to as the GII at one point, the Global Information Infrastructure. And there's a great uh, white paper that was put out by the Clinton administration in 1996 that laid out uh, policy principles for how to regulate and encourage the growth of the GII. Well, the GII didn't make it, but the internet did, and that's really what they were talking about. And they're good policy principles, but they were vague. They were things like the private sector should lead, regulation should be based on uh, non-technical principles, so uh, activities-based or, or even common law-based to the extent possible, because technology-specific lawmaking or regulation will only look silly and outdated uh, within years of its promulgation. Uh, and hopefully, we're taking that approach now. Uh, that's optimistic of me. The things that needed to change in the 90s with respect to the internet were some laws that just didn't make sense anymore. Uh, you know, highly aggressive enforcement of one's copyrights uh, didn't make sense once you had this machine that could basically costlessly reproduce 
any kind of information, books, images, movies, things like that. And we saw sort of a very uneasy coming to grips with that from policymakers and from people who wanted to enforce their copyrights. We saw lawsuits where somebody had music playing in the background of their YouTube video that was copyrighted, uh, and their YouTube video was actually just a, a video of their kid dancing to it, and they get slapped with statutory damages in the millions. Um, and then have to challenge those damages in court. That's ridiculous. We saw lawsuits that would try and stop people from being intermediaries that unwittingly hosted information provided by their users. So that had to change because if you're liable for everything that ends up on your server because you're running a, a, a news group or something like that, you're just not going to run that server anymore. Uh, that kind of vicarious or secondary liability had to go and we saw that go in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1997, I believe. So some laws had to change. Principles needed to be adopted that were technology neutral. We needed to get signals from government that these things were um, you know, important to the economy. They were jobs issues. And it was an awkward time. There were some casualties along the way, like these terrible copyright lawsuits and things like that. But we actually found a way forward, and I'm somewhat optimistic from the regulatory perspective that we'll, we'll see similar issues unfold where some big things will need to change because we can't simply continue to expect the law to be enforced the way it was before. But we'll also see you know, flexible and adaptive approaches. I, I think I'll stop there because I've already talked a little. Thanks. So I, I want to continue and ask about, um, and maybe, we, I mean, we can go in any order you want, but um, so I'll throw it out there. So um, we're all familiar with uh, national or multinational um, fiat money, and now there's a decentralized. And I would ask, how do you see, again, it's making predictions about the future, so let me ask, how would you, I mean, do you see a room for national currencies in the future? Do you see a room for the digital, sorry, the decentralized versions? What would you like to see as the right mix and the challenges there? So national or multinational versus uh, decentralized. I mean, Peter, you're holding the mic, but anyone who wants to go. Uh... So I think that like with blockchains and with the rise of just very cost efficient information technology in general, the cost of issuing a new currency is going down by a lot. And the cost to you know, just individual people of managing large, um, large quantities of different currencies is also going down by a lot. And so I mean, to me, what seems uh, qu quite plausible is that in the future, we'll see many different kinds of things that all increasingly behave like money. And some of these will be fiat currencies that are national or multinational. Some of these will be cryptocurrencies. Some of these will be corporate loyalty programs that will look in, uh, in, uh, increasingly like tokens in certain ways and may well even have you know, properties like being pr uh, product coupons and investment assets at the same time. We'll see I mean, thing, more things happening on local scales and you know, basically you know, we'll just have to adapt to this environment where like, our ideas of what we consider money will change and we'll probably have to adapt um, from beyond this kind of paradigm of seeing one particular thing as just being currency to this sort of more varied environment. Uh, one thing that I think the cost of will, uh, one cost that I think will not go down a lot is trying to determine whether a token is a good investment or not and whether you should trust the people behind the token. So unless regulation really steps up and creates an environment in which people, people feel protected and in which they can um, easily invest in new tokens that might appear the day before, uh, then I think that that's going to continue to be a huge problem. I also think that, um, you know, we're, this, this multi-token, multi-currency world, while I agree that technically sort of there's nothing keeping us from entering this world, I also think that it requires a certain amount of sophistication to engage in this world. And so we might end up seeing um, more dramatic forms of inequality in that uh, certain people feel really comfortable in this world and engage with lots of tokens and um, are comfortable with that. And certain people maybe just engage with uh, one to two different types of money instead. So to, to build on that and what Vitalik said earlier, we think of the, the economist defines money as this thing out there that has these three features. It's a store of value, it's a unit of account, it's a medium of exchange. Um, I personally think that, that two of those are information problems, a uh, medium of account or a medium of exchange and unit of account. They're questions of 
do we have a network where everyone accepts a certain thing as a medium of exchange, a valid medium of exchange? Can we build that network? Does that network have limitations where, where suddenly I'm dealing with someone who's not a part of that network and we don't recognize a common medium of exchange? And then the unit of account is, is very similar. Do we all recognize, a, 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 we all have a, an ability to come to grips with the cost of an object when we want to maybe purchase it or engage in a, in a, in a transaction to buy a service or something like that? Those are information problems. Uh, and ultimately, as we build better information systems that can also have trust built into them, I think we can, we can remove those from what we normally consider the other function of money, which is the store of value. Because any competent investment advisor would tell you that money is a terrible store of value. Uh, you should not keep all of your assets in dollars. You should not keep all of your assets in euros. You should not keep all of your assets in any fiat currency, nor do I think you should keep all of your net worth in Bitcoin. Any competent advisor would say diversify. So to Vitalik's point, I think we'll see people accumulating things through mood affinity, through things that they like, and it's a it's a mode of expression. It's these are, the, these are the tokens that represent causes that I believe in or technologies that I believe in, or maybe they're even the equities. Maybe they're actually equities of companies. And we'll keep these as a bundle, a diversified portfolio of tokens, of things that we believe we'll appreciate in value. And by investing in them, we also lend support to those projects by either enriching the people who get seniorage, by maintaining those products, the miners or things like that, if there's a block reward or by temporarily lending uh, other funds to these projects in the sense that you bought tokens for something else of value. And then the question is, if everybody's got their own unique portfolio of assets, how do we, how do we have commonality? How can we transact? Well, that's an information problem. If something is worth to you a sliver of your diversified portfolio, like I don't want to part with this car unless I enrich myself by 0.5% of my total portfolio then we just need to find a way to just equate the current market value of that sliver of your portfolio with that sliver of my portfolio. And then we use something like shapeshift on steroids to just do the transaction. Maybe it would also be trustless through uh, cross-chain atomic trades or something like that. That's an amazing world to me because we don't teach people enough about how to invest. We, we don't teach people anything about this and people have all these strange notions when in reality, the, the, the only good advice is to diversify. And so if we got away from this idea that, oh, I should store my value in this thing, in this money, and got into a more diversified uh, world, would be very good. And I, I, I think these technologies offer that, that promise, potentially. Yeah, so I think that uh, not only the medium of exchange and the unit of account are information, but the store of value function is also information, right? So the, if I hold money as a store of value, it means that I have provided that value in the past, and therefore I'm entitled to get I mean, the same amount of value in the future. And because this is information, information is universal, I don't think it will be good if there are many currencies. I mean, I agree that we're probably heading this way where there will be a lot of different countries, but I don't, don't think it's very good. Um, I don't think that every country should have its own uh, uh, money, and I don't think that every use case should have its, some more, its own money. I think money or currency should be one thing that is universal, that is used for all of the three classical functions of money. And uh, once you have several different currencies, it adds a lot of friction. So, so first, there's a friction in the medium of exchange, right? So if I want to pay someone and I have one kind of money and he wants a different kind of money, then I will need to convert it. And even if we have this shape shift on steroids, which might be much cheaper than what we have today, it will still have some cost, some friction for this transaction. And this friction would not exist if everyone just used the same kind of money. And, uh, and the same applies to both the question of the different digital currencies and the government currencies, right? I think um, one of the main reasons that a currency per, uh, per country is so popular is because up until now, people didn't know how to make a single currency that would work for everyone because uh, that would require, because we didn't have the technology to have a decentralized digital money. And if it's centralized, then no country will be trusted enough 
to be the one in charge of it. So um, I do think that, um, I mean, in my ideal world, there will be one uh, kind of money, and it will be, of course, a decentralized digital currency, and it will be a perfect currency, right, uh, mostly on the technological side, right? I mean, if we take any specific currency we have now, like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, then it has its own technological challenges. And that's also the reason why it's okay to have several classes because they need to compete on the technical mer merits, right? So we don't know if Bitcoin is better or Litecoin is better, so we need to have all of them so that they can compete. But I hope that from all of this, we will end up with one currency which won the competition and is good, and it's what everyone can use without friction, both as a medium of exchange and both it's a unit of account, right? So if I go to the grocery store and there is, uh, I don't know, some Cheetos or I don't know what, and I need to check their price, then I don't need to think about their price in shekels and their price in bitcoins and their price in all those other hundreds of currencies. There's just one price, and this is the common language for value. And once that happens, I think money, this one great currency that we'll be using, uh, I think it can be also a valid store of value because the main reason shekels and dollars are not good stores of value is because they're inflationary, so their value keeps decreasing. But if we have a currency with uh, no long-term inflation or limited long-term inflation, then it doesn't have that problem. And it also doesn't have uh, the problem of diversification. I mean, you would still want to diversify into other things than money, but even just holding the currency will be enough because it is what ubiquitous. It's not something specific. It's the money that everyone uses all over the world. So it should have a fairly stable value. So uh, that's, that's what my vision for this is. Fiat currencies have a, a, a role in the future? Yeah, we're used, uh, I mean, a few years ago there were only fiat, and now there's also decentralized. Where is this heading? Is... Uh, one thing I think about that is that we're going to have this good opportunity to experiment and learn because fiat currencies are going to keep failing, right? It, a, a typical fiat currency lasts maybe something like 100 years, and there are maybe something like 200, 250 of them in existence today, so we should expect them to fail every few years, and that'll be an interesting learning opportunity, what happens to those people who were previously depending on that thing. Uh, so it's happening right now in Venezuela. There's a lot of people and a lot of economic value uh, that's stuck, and a lot of people that are literally starving. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of like somewhere between the other predictions and predicting that the earth will continue spinning is that fiat currencies and governments will continue failing. But in like the Venezuela case, so are you aware of like initiatives where this is, um, you know, cryptocurrency is stepping up? Um, Sorry? He said uh, he sent his friends some money in Venezuela and he was able to get out to England. There's a lot of stories like that about uh, Venezuela. They're small scale. It's small scale, right? It's not. It's only. It's only the privileged few who even know what a cryptocurrency is, or have a friend who knows what a cryptocurrency is. But it's still. It's something, and it's something that it's real and is happening. So that's interesting. Um, it's uh, like Vitalik mentioned that scalability might be the most urgent problem. I don't know what use cases he was thinking of, but. Um, being accessible or useful to all the people of Venezuela is a use case that the current scalability limitations exclude. Okay, so just two comments. Uh, we'll open up for questions in 15 minutes and let 20 minutes of questions. But now, um, and another thing, I'm, I'm, to save paper, I'm looking at my cell phone from time to time because I have my question list. Um, so another question um, is, it seems that a lot of the cryptocurrency initiatives are also associated somehow with new ways of conducting business or working, foundations and initiatives and so on. And so I don't want to go necessarily into the whole ICO thing, but I'm asking you know, the relations to things like open source initiatives and decentralized working places. Um, 
I really want to hear if you can comment on that. Are you seeing transformations and you know, have any predictions? So um, full disclosure, I'm also a board member of the Zcash Foundation. Um, quite proud to serve when uh, Andrew Miller, who's the board president, asked me to join. I, I, just to tell a very brief story, I think that's an interesting model. So, and Zcash as a whole is an interesting model. You have this thing that it's a public good. The goal is to promote human dignity through the preservation of financial privacy, which I'm in complete agreement with Zuko is necessary uh, for liberty, for flourishing. Um, how can a public good be provided by a private corporation? We come to understand through economics and public choice theory that public goods should only be provided or possible possible to be provided through governments because when a private uh, organization attempts to provide them, the incentives simply aren't aligned. Uh, and if they're creating something that's got a lot of positive externalities, they will ultimately find a way to capture those positive externalities. So Google creates a lot of positive externalities on the internet. They order the internet, but they've found some very um, effective ways of capturing the value of those externalities. And if depending on how you feel about privacy, you might even find some of those uh, monetization methods somewhat. So to the extent that we want these public resources, these networks for financial privacy, for uh, censorship resistant transactions, which Bitcoin gives us already, um, how can they pro be provided? Um, I think the Zcash company was a necessity because this is such a, a cutting edge technology. Um, zero knowledge uh, uh, um, proofs, um, privacy protecting algorithms like this, that having some sort of centralized management structure was necessary to sort of jumpstart uh, an effort to develop that network. However, ultimately there has to be a handoff, I think. And the Zcash protocol has an interesting reward structure where uh, the mining reward, 20% of it, goes to people who initially invested in and worked on uh, creating the Zcash company. Uh, but that only happens for the first four years, and then it falls away. Um, why? Uh, to create trust to some extent. To create trust in what though? In the idea that the company will ultimately fall into the background and hand off development and maintenance of this essential public good to the public, to the open community of people who want to support the technology. It's already open source. It's already open consensus. Anybody can you know, run the right proof of work algorithm and participate. And the funding mechanism, the incentive mechanism to promote cooperation uh, begins with a little bit of a, 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 a pressure towards some centralization in order to ensure that there's, you know, a, a clear order of what needs to be built at the beginning of the thing, and then is designed to ultimately fall away to reward the open public for maintaining this open network. The foundation, uh, as I understand it, having spoken with Andrew Miller and spoken with Zuko and spoken with our fellow board members, the goal is ultimately to, to not uh, drop the baton in that handover, that ultimately the corporation needs to fall into the background and ultimately you need a nonprofit that will be one node, you know, not a controlling node, but one node in a network of persons who feel compelled to help uh, uh, participate in making the, the technology work. It's an interesting structure. Okay, so one of the features of cryptocurrencies which I'm very excited about in how they can create new business models in the future is the whole issue of micropayments. So uh, with traditional financial systems, you can't do micropayments. Each transaction you can do will cost at least one shekel a base fee and a significant percentage fee. Uh, now in Bitcoin, so in the beginning of Bitcoin, the transaction fees are low. Uh, we are low right now, the transaction fees in Bitcoin are quite high, but we're hoping that the Lightning Network will uh, sort that out. And of course, other cryptocurrencies have their own solutions. So once we find one way or another to have micropayments, right, to be able to send over the internet a payment of less than a cent, with, uh, of course, with very low cost and uh, instantly and so on, then there are new business models that are possible. And uh, I, mean, I think the most uh, obvious example is things related to content, right? So for example, if I go to a website that gives me some content, then the most popular form of monetization are ads, which are very annoying, as we all agree, and I personally would much prefer to pay the same amount of money that the publisher gets from those ads. 
But the problem with that is that these are very small amounts and it's difficult to pay these small amounts. So that's why we are stuck with ads. And, uh, and those sites that have a paid option usually charge a pretty high price because they know that only very few people will take the paid options. So the cost needs to be distributed among the few people that pay for it. But once we have viable micropayments, then it can be quite easy to pay this small amount for, I don't know, for every page that I'm visiting it in or whatever, and it should uh, be almost unnoticeable for the, for the person paying, but in aggregate, they will help more fund and monetize this content. And, uh, and yeah, it, it will remove the main barrier, which is the, the actual, both the fee for the payment and the procedure for entering my credit card details and so on. So that's uh, one aspect of it. The other aspect, mm -hmm. which is similar, is the ease by which I can start collecting payments, right? So if, for example, I develop some kind of project, product, let's say, a digital product and I want to sell it or receive donations even, then uh, right now there's a barrier of entry, right? It's difficult, for example, to accept credit card payments. Uh, accepting PayPal payments is a bit easier, but still you have the fee. And uh, of course, uh, uh, usually I will also have to first open a bank account. And uh, here we have a problem also uh, mostly regulatory, I guess, that, uh, that applies for younger people, right? So right now we're at the stage that you can have, you know, uh, even if you, if you take Vitalik for example, so when he was 19 he invented Ethereum, but maybe 10 years before he probably also invented stuff or could have invented, but if he wanted to publish it somehow, it would be very difficult for him because they wouldn't have been able to open an account. So once we have a system where anyone can download the software and accept payments, and the payments themselves are very cheap, then uh, we can have really more of a merit-based economy where it's mm -hmm. not so much dependent on whether I'm old enough to open a bank account and all that, but it really depends on what the person is developing and he has the power to monetize it however he sees fit. Okay, any more thoughts on uh, whether decentralized cryptocurrencies lead to interesting decentralized workforces or? Uh... Yeah, so I think one of the, thing, the things about just like cryptocurrency communities as they actually are that fascinates me is that we've somehow managed to combine money, politics, and religion into one single thing. <laughs> it's so, even if you look at, you know, just how in some circles you're supposed to talk about Bitcoin Cash and in other circles you're supposed to talk about Bcash. And this just like totally reminds me of, you know, how various countries in um, far, various corners of the world have these land disputes that in one place you're supposed to refer to some island in, uh, with one name because it's territory of country A. And you go to country B and it has a completely different name because it's territory of country B. And, you know, somehow this um, ecosystem that was supposed to uh, supplant old world politics just ended up totally replicating it. <laughs> and at the, you know, at the same time, and then religions, you know, it's uh, I think pretty obvious how, uh, how religious um, a lot of these kind of crypto communities are. And I, like the reason why I think this has happened is, I mean, in part because like, people have been religious about software for a long time, and you know, there's Mac versus Windows, Vim versus Emacs, and so forth. By the way, if you use Emacs, you should go to hell immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> uh, but the but here you know we have on the one hand uh, on the one hand these natural human tribal tendencies and on the other hand these tendencies get amplified because basically every single person has the ability to choose their allocation of cryptocurrencies and in this way actually choose their allocation of economic incentive toward one tribe or another and like with corporations you don't really have that right like most people are just customers of apple you know you, you sure you can be shareholders but like you know as we were saying most people don't really go and like 
actively choose to be shareholders of you know, one, co one company or another company. Then, you know, whereas here, every person has you know, some quantity of various crypto tokens, right from the start of the ICO all the way up until you know, it goes really big and all the way up until it uh, blows up and people lose interest. And it's um, like these, just this kind of hyper accessibility of uh, like incentives and of people's ability to actively choose what they basically what their exposure to different incentives is and just and also people the community's reliance on this, the activities of this large group of people to promote itself and give itself value. So you know, just all cryptocurrencies are heavily dependent on individual on just the work of tens or and thousands of people to do things like promote it, build software for it, build an, e build an ecosystem for it, convince other people to build projects on top of it, themselves build projects on top of it, means that you do have this very unique environment and one that I think that, you know, eventually sociologists will have a, lo a lot of fun studying for a long time because it really is something that we haven't had before. And you know, if we can, um, Imagine these kind of you know, sort of quasi-economic, quasi-religious tribes become, being something that becomes more more uh, more prevalent and, and uh, used in other applications. Then you know things, things the world definitely could look very different just in terms of how we interact. I just realized we really haven't actually seen a legit religion yet with its own ICO. <laughs> That's, that's interesting. Not just the ICO part, but also what they would do with... Or what? Um, There's some Jewish thing, but I don't know if it's a joke or not. Uh, I'm sorry, so apparently there is one, and I've, uh, I've missed it. Jewish coin, 10% automatic. Bitcoin, uh, but Bitcoin. is it... Uh, Actually, it relates to what I wanted to say. What? Uh, it relates to what I was going to say, which is that... Um, well, I really like the experimentation I've been seeing in, on technical substrate level, but I'm also looking forward to the results of ex all the experimentation on this social level, because Ali was asking what kind of different sorts of human organization like work uh, might turn up. And there are all these ideas, which are probably like 99% bad ideas, um, but it's really going to be fun to see what happens when they get tried. Uh, and here's one of my bad ideas. I, I, I want to make it so that whenever I shake hands with anyone and look in their eyes, then my phone remembers their public key, and then uh, every week for the rest, for a long time after that, uh, my phone's going to take like a tiny little fraction of its current wallet and send it to them, like once a week, to everyone that I've ever shaken hands with. And everyone else is going to do the same thing. Even the ones you don't like. I guess people I really don't like, I'm going to refuse to shake their hand, I guess. Oh, you should. Okay. I'll just have to go delete them out of my phone later when um, they're not looking. Um, but, and, and then everyone's going to do the same thing so that, um, I don't know. I mean, I can't, I, you can't prevent me from unshaking it. There's no way, although there actually might be some ways to make it verifiable to the society whether I'm participating uh, correctly in this social process. Anyway, maybe one of those cults that's going to have its own ICO will set that up uh, as a kind of um, tithe or whatever. So I have a long list of questions that I want, but I, I also want to reserve time um, for questions. So my last one, and I'll, I'll try to keep, uh, okay, try to keep the answers brief so we have a, a qu time for questions from the audience, is so you're all sort of established leaders in this new field. And I wonder, you know, when you wake up in the morning and say, this is my moral bearing and this is what, what I want to achieve, I'm like, or it keeps me going. I really want to hear what, what, what is it that, uh, if you have an answer, like, where are you heading? Who wants to start? Yeah. I'm totally motivated by the notion of just distributing freedom more widely. So that's totally why I keep doing this job every day. <laughs> because what happens every day when I wake up in the morning is I look at my phone and I think, oh, what kind of crisis has arisen in the last eight hours that I now <laughs> need to panic about and work on all day long? Um, anyway, but I'm really motivated by it. Uh, I think I'm quite motivated by 
how ridiculous our existing financial system is and how unfair it is to most people and how we seem to accept it as though that's the way that the world must be. Um, and so I, I look at that, I look at hedge funds that are worth billions upon billions of dollars um, and people throwing money away. I look at the level of inequality in the world. Uh, I look at sort of what I perceive to be the unfairness that we simply accept. I look at countries that um, were charged exorbitant interest rates on loans and had to end up cutting fundamental services to their people in order to repay back those loans to incredibly rich countries simply because that's like a moral imperative that we accept, that you're supposed to pay back your loans, even if it's a ridiculous interest rate. Um, so I look at all these things and uh, this technology is the first thing that I've seen that might have the potential to recreate that system or to affect that system. So that's why I work on this. Yes, uh, I guess my story is a bit similar to Neha because what drew me originally to Bitcoin is the fact that it seems that the financial institutions that we have have not been affected by technology as much as other aspects, right? In the past hundred years or so, technology has developed at a very rapid pace affected pretty much every aspect of our lives, but it didn't seem to make much of an impact on the economy, on banking, and so on. So I thought it's about time to take the concept of the technological revolution and apply it to the economy. And I was fortunate enough to, learn, to first learn about this new uh, Bitcoin thing to take part in the revolution and have an actual impact, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how much I would believe it if, if I only had heard about it when it was already an established thing, probably wouldn't have been able to impact it that much. But uh, once you also hear about it early enough and, uh, and uh, follow it early enough, then it's possible to have a real influence on, on how, this, uh, how this revolution evolves. So before, just we can, I want to hear the, so I suggest that people who want to ask questions sort of will also do a decentralized. So if you can move like to the front row and we'll just put a mic there and, uh, and then uh, the questions will, uh, you know, you will decentralize in a decentralized way, fine, you know, pass the microphone. Sorry. Yeah, so I think for, like, for me personally, both of those things um, apply. I mean, the one kind of personal story that I have is when I was getting into Bitcoin for the same time, and or for the first time, I was uh, 17, and you know, like at the time, I didn't have my own bank card, and I had no easy way of just make, going out to make my own money online. And I uh, joined a uh, uh, or went to a Bitcoin forum, and I immediately thought, okay, you know, this is this cool new Bitcoin thing. I want to try and get into, and I want to earn some Bitcoins. I did not have any computer hardware, so I, the only way I had to make money was to look for a job. So I you know, went and uh, eventually found this one guy who was working on a Bitcoin blog. And he would pay me five Bitcoins per article, which back then was about four dollars, to uh, write, just to write articles for his website. And I did this. I uh, earned about 20 Bitcoins at an average wage of about 1.5 dollars an hour. Yay, fight for 1.5! <laughs> and we, yeah, and I spent eight and a half of them on a t-shirt. And I, when I just, when I, and then eventually, despite um, pay, uh, paying me way below minimum wage, this guy went bankrupt. And in order to save this website, I uh, came up with this uh, business model where what we would do is every week, we would, I would write two articles. We would publish the first paragraph of each article. And we would, and we would put, put out two Bitcoin addresses. And we would say, we are holding these two articles back for ransom. If people are, uh, do collectively donate 2.5 Bitcoins to this address, then we will release the rest of this article. And this actually worked. And this actually managed to bump up my earnings to about $6 an hour. <laughs> and I thought, you know, just the ability of, you know, through, uh, just the fact that a community of a few thousand people, just like myself, with computers just like my own, could just entirely by themselves main, just kind of recreate these basic institutions of society, so in this case being currency, and just I'll talk, like, and you know have the freedom to do things like experimenting with totally new business models is just something that immediately seemed exciting to me. So, so 
So this has all been very hopeful, and I don't know why the first thing that came to my mind was actually kind of pessimistic and depressing, but the thing that um, motivates me often when I get up in the morning, so I live in Washington, D.C., uh, which has changed pretty drastically, uh, the mood at least, with, as you all surely followed, uh, our, our political upheavals that are happening right now on both, both parties, both the Democrats and the Republicans, Trump being a very visible sign, but the lack of a, a, of a coherent uh, Democratic Party to challenge, uh, to some extent, is also quite interesting. And the thing that always comes to mind is, is, is that uh, maybe what we did with the internet was decentralize information and group affiliation before decentralizing power. And that's actually a very frightening possibility because you have now more little insular fringe communities fighting over temporary control of a still single or monolithic power structure. And the, the frightening possibility there is somebody from a fringe will manage to temporarily take this very powerful position on the world stage. Uh, whereas previously we had these sort of like lumpy media organizations like big television stations, there were only four of them in the US or three before that. Now there's thousands and, and whereas before, those would be the gatekeepers for, for democracy. Um, the third estate played a real role in limiting the sorts of people who would end up in these positions of profound power. And that was very anti-democratic, actually, and very uh, dangerous in its own right. But the danger is the centralization of power. Um, and we haven't fixed that problem with the internet yet. And to the best of my knowledge, these systems are our best hope of, of starting to, to change that, that, that way that power is, is organized within our societies, hopefully to make it as decentralized as our media and our information systems have become, because otherwise we're going to constantly have strange bands that are temporarily able to sway the masses, obtain the strong position of central power, and possibly do terrible things with that profound power. So, dark, but that, that's one of the things that that motivates me. <laughs> okay, so now we'll... Okay, so Hi. Wait, just so again, anyone who wants um, to ask a question, please, so the mic is over there, and then, you know, move forward and uh, coordinate among yourself. So I'm new to this field, and I've been working on it for a few months now, and I'm quite fascinated by all the possible applications, and we are currently working on one. Uh, but when uh, you mentioned that uh, fiat currencies could be completely removed, uh, it makes me wonder um, what would be the implication. For example, uh, states have a role, for example, by using taxes to build infrastructure, uh, pay for teachers and researchers and uh, many public goods that are necessary. If um, all transactions are hidden, how can you ensure that uh, you can collect the taxes that are necessary for uh, the public, uh, the, like for everyone's benefit? Uh, because everyone would be in, incentivized to be a free rider. And uh, there's also another situation that came to mind. Um, when a state, uh, for different reasons, um, made poor choices and now uh, basically his economy is on the ground because of debts and uh, he cannot go on the market to uh, get more money. Uh, today there are uh, processes that allow, for example, to remove the debt and start anew. I'm in France and that's, for example, in Europe the talk we've been having about Greece and uh, the situation of Greece. And I'm curious about like if every uh, fiat currencies were removed, how could you achieve uh, those mechanisms that are necessary for the population? Thank you. So I think uh, that there's um, a few things that kind of needs to be unpacked in that question. So first of all, like, I personally don't believe that uh, cryptocurrencies will completely replace fiat currencies, especially in the short and medium term. And my reason for this is actually that I believe, like, I don't believe in this kind of single, uh, single currency theory, specifically at least in part because the optimal properties for a store of value and the optimal properties of a unit of account are very different. 
right? So with a store of value, you want it to be an investment asset that roughly goes up with, with the world GDP, whereas for a medium of, for a unit of account, you actually, and there's good macroeconomic reasons why you want it to be something that's stable, and you want it to be something that slightly goes down over time, and you want it to be something that has behavior like uh, going down by 10 or 20% in a recession, right? And these three properties of a unit of account, though, totally do not mean that these are uh, at all good properties for a store of value to have, or even for a medium of exchange to have. So, at the v like, it may well be possible that we'll have a future where, you know, like the like cryptocurrencies are our primary currencies, but we still have, you know, like some governments like. Uh, a consumer, you know, consumer price index authority that just like publishes some num some number that's like that, that represents some stable unit unit of value, and that's what people denominate things in without ever actually using it as a currency. But you know, there's lot, lots of weird possibilities there. The second thing in, regarding taxes is that first of all, like we had cash for thousands of years, and the vast majority of transactions were anonymous for thousands of years, and even today even as the kind of crypt the crypto world gets uh, better and better at going dark in certain ways the physical world gets ever gets uh, closer and closer to like pretty much unstoppable surveillance to the point where you know like even like the like antifa people who are wearing masks can get easily identified by people with the right machine learning so there are plenty of ways to first of all there's plenty of different kinds of things that could serve as a basis of tax there is plenty of ways to detect business activity and you know, even if you do not have taxation of every, you know, even if you do not have ways of seeing, of seeing every single financial transaction, there are many kinds of business activity that will continue to be highly visible that could be used as a source of taxes. Now, does this mean that we have, that we have to de-emphasize things like income taxes that, that also apply to fully digital transaction and transactions that increase emphasis on, you know, things like taxes on natural resources, possibly, but, you know, like civilizations have changed a lot in thousands of years, and tax bases have changed a lot in thousands of years, and I'm sure they can continue to change as, uh, to, as technology requires it. So I don't think that there are any kind of fundamental civilizational problems in there. At least in the United States, taxes aren't extracted by surveillance of the monetary system. Employers are required to pay income taxes primarily on behalf of their employees. So it wouldn't make any difference if the employers were paying the employees with uh, privacy preserving currency. They would still disclose that um, as appropriate to the IRS or the regulators or the police if there were a warrant or whatever. Um, but the only difference would be then those pay stubs wouldn't be visible to all the random people on the internet. Uh, except if also the flow of money that got into that company were also hidden and could not be tracked. But that's, that's also true. There's a lot of tax evasion yep. currently, and there's a lot of tax paying currently, and that is probably not going to fundamentally change with the changing nature of the money. Because, to reiterate, the ability for the government to inspect financial flows, like through banks, is not used for taxation. Wait, but much. I'd like to get more questions if there are. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, no, I want to argue about taxes more. <laughs> Who is it? Hi. So, so I'd like to ask if you think that the tokens that we're seeing right now, are, are they replacing services or are they inventing new services? <laughs> are we going to have another conference like this next year? A what? Another, are we oh, have because the, then you'll answer? Yeah, ask me <laughs> next year. <laughs> uh, I'm in favor of that if someone else organizes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, they, the, the, the projects that are raising money that I actually do believe in, and I think they're probably a minority of the projects raising money, are providing existing services but in a decentralized fashion. So, uh, a coin, storage, Filecoin, um, these are addressing what right now is a service provided by Amazon uh, in their S3 product. Uh, and Amazon basically now, because of their ability to really build efficiency around that cloud storage project, uh, product, they, they own a giant chunk of the web. Even Netflix uses Amazon 
uh, as their back end, part of their back end, even though they're kind of rivals. Netflix and Amazon Prime are both streaming providers. Dropbox, until recently, used S3 as their back end, even though they're both cloud stored. This is a dangerous infrastructure issue. And if these token projects, some of which, like Filecoin, have raised $250 million, and I sort of gasp and I think, oh god, Juan, what have you done? Um, and I think he's uh, amazing, and if there's anybody who should have that kind of startup capital to build something, I, I, I would put my vote behind Juan, amongst others. I worry, but I also believe that that's a very important mission, that decentralizing the, the back end of the internet, whether it's uh, cloud storage, whether it's a DNS certificate authorities, that's very important. So it's the same product, um, but in, it delivered in a much different way, which could be meaningful for competition policy, for human flourishing, censorship resistance, things like that. Uh, I just want to say I completely disagree. I think we often forget that the internet is already quite decentralized, and censorship on the level of DNS and domain name registration is not really our primary problem. So we wrote a report on this, actually. It's 100 pages. You probably don't want to read it, but uh, it's, called, it's about the decentralized web. It's about all these so-called technologies that are claiming to fix the problems of the internet by decentralizing file systems into a distributed hash table. Um, can, can I just say, like, uh, personally, I, I'm just going to be a little grumpy here. I think most of the ICOs are scams. They're completely scams. They're raising money. <laughs> They're raising money the exact same way that IPOs raise money, which is by setting aside a portion of your shares for a select number of investors who are friends or powerful people and doing those, giving that out at reduced prices ahead of the token sale. That's what Filecoin did. That's what all of these ICOs do. IPOs are scams too? Yes. They're the same thing. So, and, and another thing is... So I, I, okay. So, and another thing is decentralized storage in particular is something, or storage in particular, is something that dramatically benefits from economies of scale, okay? My laptop's hard drive storage is extraordinarily expensive. And I don't care if all of you out there have an extra gig or two on your hard drive. The way that the internet is structured, the way the bandwidth is structured, the way that upload, download rates are structured, Amazon, Google, Dropbox, Microsoft, Facebook, they are always going to be able to provide much, much, much cheaper storage. Decentralized storage doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Uh, so that's my two cents. Maybe someone here will convince me that I'm wrong. I think um, one of the points against what you just said, I mean, I don't know, I don't know the exact numbers. Is this cheaper, is this cheaper? But we need to remember that one of the advantages of decentralized storage is utilizing existing infrastructure, right? So Amazon or Google and all that, if they want to provide storage, they actually have to buy the drives and, uh, and put them just in order to provide the storage. Whereas if I am a personal user and I bought a new computer, then right now my hard drive is mostly empty, right? I bought a large drive, so it will be good for me for the next several years, but un until I manage to fill it up, I have a lot of space that already exists, and I didn't have to pay extra for it. I just have it based on the way I use my computer normally. So while I have this um, available space, it's basically zero cost to provide it. Now, there are bandwidth costs and so on, but I think that still, um, uh, uh, personal users have infrastructure that is underutilized. They can provide it cheaper than a dedicated service, even if it has economies of scale. And additionally, um, there are other advantages for, for doing de decentralized. So you can have much more redundancy than with those other services, right? So you could replicate your data on hundreds of completely separate machines which will not be the case with centralized storage providers who um, were it's still under the roof of one specific entity. And uh, of course, if we try to integrate um, decentralized storage with other decentralized systems, such as smart contracts on Ethereum, then it integrates much better than if we tried to use a centralized storage provider. I think aside from that, there's also two other major kind of economic advantages that decentralized systems can have. 
I mean, one of them that should obviously that should not be underemphasized is just censorship resistance. So, you know, even if you agree with like let's say certain decisions that Cloudflare State has uh, taken to take down certain websites so far, you may well not. Uh, chan chances are you're not going to agree with all of the future ones. Um, and just even giving one organization that level of power is, I think, something that could be co-opted way too easily. And the second important one is um, the fact that just users, so like the consumer base, is inherently decentralized and will continue to be that way. And a lot of web services do benefit from proximity to the user, right? So if, for example, you know, we're all on the same local subnetwork and I have, and I've already downloaded, you know, some a semi-popular web page and you want to download the same thing, well, it might actually be more efficient for you to, for you to download the page for me than from going all the way up to a server. So uh, there are some, and uh, the third one being unused capacity, though I will say that economies of scale is kind of the factor in the other direction. I think I have the record for having implemented the most decentralized storage systems that failed, which was four. <laughs> and and I also implemented one that works pretty well, but the way that one works was it gave up on decentralizing the storage of the ciphertext and just retained decentralization of access control using cryptography, but centralized the control of the ciphertext, uh, you know, as the actual bulk storage. Um, so basically, at a technical level, I think Niho's right. Um, that's all. So uh, we have time just for one last question, because, uh, yeah. Try to make it count. Um, do you have any prediction about the appearance of uh, borderless states, uh, where at a certain point I can be like a digital nomad and decide to be like a citizen of a awesome. certain state? Uh, We're going to have new religions and new states. Yep. <laughs> though, though a state. You know, there's that um, digital identity of Estonia going on, right? Yep. You know about that one? Yeah, I've heard about that one. You can get some services such as get a business or a bank, but I wonder going all the way to get like, uh, you know, medical uh, insurance and pretty much every other thing you get except for maybe, I don't know, security or whatever. This reminds me of the Diamond Age. May, may I ask the answer about something? All right. So, if you uh, so maybe take from there. So. Yeah, sure. And if you have anything on it, it's... So I'm just, in my, one of my ads, I'm the uh, ambassador of uh, Liberland to Israel. It's a libertarian country that was founded between uh, Croatia and Serbia. Ambassador and, uh, of? I mean, some of you may have heard of it. Ambassador, yeah. Sorry, ambassador yeah. of? Who? It's a new country uh, between Croatia and Serbia. There was a no man's land there. And uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Liberland. Liberland. It, it uh, has liber, a, wait, like liberty it have a and land. It has a physical territory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's uh, seven on seven kilometers, which ah. is, uh, I mean, bigger than Monaco, but uh, yeah. So um, we actually deal with the same uh, issues. So basically, uh, it's, you know, it was established two and a half years ago, but it's still, of course, a process that is uh, going on. And currently, you can register businesses and, um, uh, well, other things. <laughs> we, uh, well, now, one of the things that people are talking about is how do you get, uh, yeah, things like medical insurance, because, for example, uh, I mean, it's a libertarian country, so we also have the issue of how uh, government uh, should have uh, less and less power and so on. But those are things that are uh, being done. So, you know, I don't want to answer now, you know, like uh, to give a lecture about it. So, you know, if you're interested about it, just Google uh, Liberland. There is Liberland.org. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, if you would uh, Google, I don't know, Liberland Registry or things like that, then uh, people are discussing. Okay, so anyone want to answer? Uh... Go microstates. Sorry, micro not as a pejorative, it's, it's cool. Um, I, I think it, to the extent you can imagine a public good that's not tied to geography, you can imagine the emergence of a community that would provide that public good to its members who voluntarily choose to associate together, and you could almost call that some sort of a, a digital nation of a sort. I mean, 
we have governments in theory, well, there's different perspectives on why we have nation states. It's the monopoly of violence within a territory, a legitimate use of violence within a territory, or it, more optimistically, also the provision of public goods, one of which is national defense uh, and, and a standing army and things like that. There are other public goods that seem to have very little to do with geography. Uh, chief among them, actually, things just like welfare and redistribution, or societies of mutual aid or insurance. Um, safety nets. Those are things that seem to have very little to do with where you particularly happen to be in the world. So if there are different and varying approaches to how to best provide those sorts of public goods like social safety nets, then it would make sense that maybe we'll see the emergence of communities uh, uh, on the internet using these new technologies to form trust and bonds to each other that will provide those sorts of government, now what we consider, currently consider government services. Okay, so I guess, uh, what, um, okay. I think, uh, do we have time for one more question? Let's take a vote. The dinner is at 6 o'clock. We could go on till 6 o'clock. Uh, we could take a little bit of a rest before dinner. So who wants to go on? Uh, okay. <laughs> who wants to... Go out. Okay, so we'll we'll go on a little bit, uh, I guess. What? And of course, uh, you know, it's uh, people are free to go out if they. Uh, um, okay. It's working. Yeah. Can I ask? Um, I Maybe let's question. say go on for another, let's say, two questions, and then uh, so that. Uh, uh, wait, wait, I, have a, uh, okay. I have a question about uh, basically all the compute power used to make all the system work. Uh, why do you think that uh, nothing has catched on that puts it to good use besides crunching hashes? Also, maybe uh, so a recommendation because I see there are many people wanting to ask questions. So if we can keep the answers short, short then we'll have more questions. So. Yes, so Bitcoin is based on the concept of proof of work, and there has been a lot of people trying to say that they want the proof of work to be actually useful, but that's kind of a problem because in order for the proof of work to be usable to synchronize the Bitcoin transactions, um, it can't really be used for anything else because it has some specific requirements. It needs to have a, a tunable difficulty. It needs to be based on a specific uh, previous uh, data, and it has all sorts of other requirements, and it needs to be decentralized, of course, and, um, and it's not really compatible with um, other users for this computation. That's why a lot of people have hopes for a, a proof of stake system, which doesn't require all these computations. Myself, I haven't yet been convinced that, I mean, it's a very good idea, proof of stake, I'm not sure that there are any good implementations for it, but maybe Vitalik will want to elaborate because they want to do something along these lines in Ethereum, so. Um, yeah, so there's a question about proof of, um, I mean, like, well, I talked about proof of stake earlier, earlier in the week, and like the general principle here is basically that instead of having a consensus algorithm that's uh, back where the economic limitations are backed by real world assets, you have one where the economic limitations are backed by kind of digital assets inside the system. And the economic security models of this kind of tends to be inductive. So it basically tends to say the system, was, you know the system was secure at time n, therefore you can prove the system will be secure at time n plus one, and that's why, this, and, and that's why the coin has value at time n, and then you keep on going for 10 plus two and so forth. But there's, there has been uh, some, I mean, quite a bit of uh, mathematical research in uh, various directions of this, of just, how these algorithms work. I mean, per, like personally, I am optimistic that um, I mean, like, I have very good models do exist, but it is the sort of thing that I think uh, will be refined over time. Um, was there any other part to the question? Well, maybe, maybe, or. Uh, okay, the question I, I, was uh, whether uh, you think it is possible to put this, this uh, computational power to good use? Oh, uh, useful proof of work. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say, 
And I, I have thought about this a lot, and like to me, like theoretically it is possible, but practically there are like, three major obstacles, which is that in order to have a good proof of work problem, first of all, it needs to be hard to compute and easy to verify, and most useful work is not of that property. Second, it's very hard to have proof of work functions that um, do, or th to have useful work functions that do not operate under or that do not require like, large amounts of external input data. So for example, most of the useful work that we see so far, like folding at home, some of the like, SETI at home, some of the astronomy stuff, tends to have you know, like, very large input data sets. About, like, here is you know, a really big, huge picture of the sky. Here is a bunch of data about proteins. And in a decentralized system, it's not clear who's going to provide that information. And the third problem is that you need a problem whose usefulness has lasting value. And my opinion is that you know, if we ma manage to somehow create a Bitcoin that's based on folding at home, then there's just going to be so much computation and we'll get some, prog or some real progress for about a year. Then the marginal value of that will just decline to close to zero and we'll have to find some other uh, programming problem. And so this would require just like frequent hard forks and probably frequent arguments about which useful work problem is more important to maintain itself. Thank you. <laughs> Electricity in Israel, I think, is very expensive, so I'm not sure this is where the uh, mining is profitable. Yeah, so maybe next question. Yeah, um, about the ICOs and all the funding, um, I really think that cryptocurrency, cryptocurrencies enables um, the development of really, really big technologies and I'm really sure we are going to see it in the future because it's basically, I believe that it's replacing the place of VCs, of venture capitals, and it gives to the crowd um, the power. It gives basically, it adds a wisdom of the crowds to many, many technologies and many, it gives many options to individuals to develop their projects, researchers, um, for example, here... Wait, wait, but is there a question? Yeah, yeah so uh, what's the question? I, and there are many that want to ask, so briefly. Yeah, I, I want to, to, give, to get your opinion about what is the part of wisdom of the crowd in those ICOs. How, how is it implemented? What do you think about that? Let's, uh, let's try to keep it brief so we... Yeah, have so I think and recent more. events have shown that the crowd isn't so wise. And, uh, and, and as yes, opposed to so past events, as opposed to past events, which well, I'm sure well the events happen all the time. But, but yeah, I mean, in theory, yeah, the 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 whole world of cryptocurrency is open a new way to raise uh, funding for projects, and that's very nice. But what's going on with the ICOs is a sort of bastardization of this uh, ideal, right? So we see investments of. Uh, of completely disproportional amounts for projects that don't really have anything. And we see that the investors don't really get anything in return. They don't get shares in the company or whatever. They get tokens, which are not clear what good they are going to be. So right now it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the crowd will need to wisen, right? I mean, I guess once uh, the novelty wears out and people will get used to this new, um, this new world, then you can have a lot of power in the wisdom of the crowds, but right now, we are not there yet. So I have this somewhat kind of, this sort of more nuanced uh, contrarian theory where I claim that ICO participants broadly are being rational because they are correctly predicting the ongoing irrationality and craziness of the cryptocurrency secondary markets. So the, um, like even outside of just ICOs in general, you know, this is the area where we have multi-billion dollar currencies that have trinary custom hash functions and just in general, like things going up to, you know, basically where, you know, like, if you, okay, if you, you know, like, Bitcoin is worth uh, um, more than the majority of fiat currencies. Has it done more than the, more than the majority of fiat currencies? And, so, and even if you agree with the general magnitude, there isn't yet that large a correlation between kind of the value of something and its usefulness. And so, just economically speaking, like it, it feels more like this kind of 
equilibrium where it's more about just people gravitating around these sort of social shelling points about what should be valuable rather than any idea, like rather than these kind of concrete ideas of what's um, actually going to be widely used. And that's in part because we, I mean, we do still not have a very good idea of you know what's go what's going to be widely used. Like we have, you know, ongoing arguments about you know, whether or not. Like, uh, whether, like to what extent decentralized storage systems make sense for various use cases, like whether, uh, whether or not this idea of you know, a cryptocurrency that has, that's being used as a medium of exchange within, within one application makes sense. I mean, my opinion is that it doesn't, but you know, like other, other people disagree. And look, a lot of this is just, in part, just because we have very little data to sample from, right? Like almost all applications of cryptocurrencies at this point are speculative. Like me, crypto, cryptocurrency as a currency, I think has at least partially proven itself. And there may be one or two other, sm um, other small use cases, but you know, you, maybe you can, I mean, you can call e like, uh, ENS at least, uh, at least kind of successful. But otherwise, you know, like no one knows whether decentralized insurance is workable. No one knows whether, you know, like all of these various like decentralized X systems are workable, and if they are workable, to what extent the token inside of them actually will have any value. And so, like, I personally, I mean, have, having thought of this for a while, I just don't really see any kind of good so good solution to any of this other than just waiting a while and uh, seeing what makes sense. You know, like I do think a lot of things will end up, the vast majority of things will end up not making sense, but you know, that's how entrepreneurship works in general. Okay, so, to oh, sorry. Very briefly follow on that. I, I, I think probably most ICO buyers are irrational, but I think there's a social benefit actually to bubbles. Um, this is how entrepreneurship works. This is how creative destruction works. Projects that may never have gotten funded in a perfectly rational market um, are now getting funded. And some of those, the vast majority of those projects will be terrible ideas, but maybe one of them will be the, the thing that actually makes a, a big difference in the world. So that's not exactly the wisdom of crowds, it's the wisdom of idiots. <laughs> okay, so last question. Yes. I wonder how do you see uh, the potential of uh, reputation management and trust management on the blockchain and potential impact on uh, society? Trust management is the, something like the example you just gave earlier about something like what? Pay, paying to someone that you shook his hand. <laughs> Let's do a token about. <laughs> All right, I admit I'm, I'm tired. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I am really interested in that kind of thing as one of those crazy ideas that almost all turn out to have been bad ideas. Um, but I really like the idea of sort of post money. You know, so solve, sa satisfying some of the needs that we use money to satisfy, but with a different thing that's not money. Like, I'm not exactly sure how it would work, but like if you, if you need some extra gas and groceries one week, you can sort of like borrow it from all your friends, but none of them will ever know how much you borrowed, but there's still some kind of constraint on the overall system, so there's the balance and the correct resource allocation and efficiency. I think there's something like that that's possible. I don't know if it'll ever actually happen, but I really think there's more that is possible than we have tried. Okay, so uh, even if we move someday to post money, we we'll, won't be post food anytime <laughs> soon. So let's thank all the panel members and uh, go get. <laughs>